All right. How are you guys doing this morning? Good? Okay, Doug's doing good. Is anybody else in the house? <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to look at this morning the wisdom in the heart. Wisdom in the heart. Last time we looked at uh, opening our series on wisdom through the book of Proverbs. Wisdom uh, calls aloud. And today we're going to look at the heart and what does wisdom look like in our hearts. And so uh, I just feel like we should pray. So let's pray again. And we're going to ask the Lord specifically just to shine the light on our hearts this morning, just to turn his flashlight onto the, our, our hearts and see what he might speak to us this morning. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are here and that, Lord, wherever you are, Lord, there's freedom. And wherever you are, Lord, there is safety. Lord, that wherever you are, there's peace. And so, Lord, we know that in this pl place right now that it's a safe place for you to work. And so as we look at the subject of wisdom in our hearts, Lord, that you would shine your light where you desire to work, Lord, that this would be a safe place for you to do whatever you desire to do. And so, Lord, begin that work in us, Lord. You've already, you've already said you've begun it, but, Lord, just continue that work in us. Bring into the light of conversation with you whatever you desire to speak to us about this morning. And, Lord, we are looking forward to what you have to say in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, have you ever planted a, a garden in your backyard? You ever done that before? Yeah? Uh, my wife, uh, her dad was the most incredible gardener in Escondido. And so if you go into her backyard, she's got, fr there's fruit trees there. And, you know, he grew rhubarb. He grew alala berries. He grew Swiss chard, which my, my wife said is, was the most important thing that he grew. Uh, he grew uh, radishes. I mean, he grew all kinds of things. But the thing he was most famous for was his corn. He grew incredible corn. And uh, he was from Idaho. So, uh, and he, oh, he also grew potatoes. Um, that was the Idaho connection. Uh, so he grew all kinds, just all kinds of stuff. And before, um, you know, he died and went home to be with the Lord, he taught my wife how to grow corn. You know, told her how to prepare the soil. And, and it's not like you can just go to Lowe's or Walmart and grab a bunch of seed and just kind of throw it in the ground and expect it to grow. You know, you have to dig a hole. You have to prepare the soil, you know. And she would dig this big hole, and, and then she would put all this soil in there and put all these nutrients, and she would prepare the soil to receive the seed. You know, she prepared the soil to receive that seed that was going to grow into something. And, you know, in all of that hard work, she didn't mind doing all that hard work because she knew at the end of it all she would produce this incredible corn uh, in our backyard, and, and we did that one year. Uh, apparently, it was a lot more work than she intended it to be, uh, <laughs> but, she, but she grew this incredible corn, and, but, you know, not only do you have to, you know, prepare the soil, but then after that, you have to water it constantly. You have to keep it up. You have to pull weeds. You have to, you know, keep your cats and your dogs out of the corn. You know, you have, there's a lot you have to do in order to grow amazing corn and to keep it, you know, to where it bears fruit. And it's that way with our own hearts. You know, it's the same way when it comes to our hearts. Uh, we need to take care of our hearts. And Solomon said it like this in Proverbs chapter 4. If you turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 4. And he talks about the heart. And he talks about the care of the heart. And if you need a Bible here, just hand, raise your hand up and we'll get one to you. We got Bibles, uh, extra Bibles for everyone. So if you need a Bible here this morning, uh, just raise your hand up high and we'll get one to you. Uh, but Roman, uh, we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 4. And in verse 23, it says this, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. You know, when Solomon says, out of our hearts spring the issues of life, he literally means that the heart is the starting point for all the activities of life. Everything we do flows out of our heart. Every activity that we participate in flows out of our heart. And so we're to take care of our hearts. We're to uh, keep our hearts with all diligence. The heart determines the course of life. 
in Proverbs 16, 9, it says, A man's heart plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. So it's a man's heart that plans his way. The things that we want to do in our lives come out of our heart. Faith resides in the heart. Proverbs 3, 5 says that we're to trust the Lord with what? All our heart. So faith resides in our hearts. Uh, wisdom resides in the heart. Proverbs 10, 8 speaks of the wise in heart. The, excuse me, the wise in heart. You know, did you know that your emotions reside in your heart? That emotions reside in our hearts? Proverbs 14, 3 says, Even in laughter the heart may sorrow, and at the end of mirth may be grief. You know, laughter and sorrow can reside in our hearts at the same time. Isn't that amazing? That's how complicated our hearts are. That we can have conflicting emotions in our hearts at the same time. Some of you are like saying, oh, that's your problem now. You just figured out your husband or your wife. Uh, they're all conflicted with these emotions. I'm conflicted. Um, but also anxiety resides in the heart. Proverbs 12, 25 says, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. But a good word makes it glad. You know, anxiety. Bitterness resides in the heart. Proverbs 14 says, uh, 14.10 says, The heart knows its own bitterness, and a stranger does not share its joy. And so all of these emotions reside in our hearts. Jesus said, out of the heart comes evil thoughts in Matthew 15.19. And so that's why Solomon tells us to keep our hearts with all diligence. We're to keep our hearts with all diligence. Now, what does it mean to keep your heart with all diligence? Now, what is he talking about when he says that? Well, there are five basic meanings behind keeping our hearts with all diligence. When you look it up in the Bible dictionary, there's five basic meanings you're going to find. The first simply means to exercise great care over just to exercise great care, meaning it implies consistent, faithful, and diligent care. Now, one of my wife's greatest strengths, we were talking about this recently, uh, this morning actually, is consistency. She is very consistent. She says, I should be paid to, to, to find out what's wrong with things. And I said, no, you do that quite good for free. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> She, you know, she just, she can walk in and she can point out what is inconsistent. You know, look at a bunch of things, says that's not consistent. Or she's really good at knowing what's fair, what's not fair, making sure everybody gets treated equally. Consistency is one of her great gifts. And so when it comes to changing the oil in our cars, she's in charge of the oil changes because she will make sure that they will happen on time when they're supposed to. It's almost like she has this built-in clock. She has a, a thing with my Ford F-150. You know, she gets in the car and she goes, this truck is due for an oil change. I'm like, how do you know? She says, I just feel it. You know, she, you know, she looks at the little thing. It says, it's, you're, you're like 5,000 miles over the, you know, over what you're supposed to be. And I'm saying, yeah, but it's still running. You know, and so, but she's really good at, at keeping things consistent. And as a result, our cars run for an incredibly long period of time. You know, they just keep going and keep going and keep because of that consistency of care. And our hearts are the same way. When we're diligent in caring for our hearts, our hearts stay free from attitudes and emotions that can lead to psychological and relational damage. You know, God is concerned about your psychology. God is concerned about your relationships. God is concerned about your mind. God is concerned about your heart. Because out of it flows the issues of life. The second meaning is to pay careful attention to living God's way. In Proverbs 10, 8, it says, The wise in heart will receive commands, but a prating fool will fall. Now, when I come to Christ, when I come into this relationship now that I have with Jesus, and I enter into that covenant of grace that I now have with Jesus, that, that you know, by grace I'm saved and I'm brought into that, that fellowship with him. My relationship with, with Jesus is now restored 
uh, from being just a distant relationship to now being up close and personal. My relationship with him isn't based on the rules and the regulations. My relationship with him is based on a, a personal interaction with him on a continuing basis. And that's the difference between the law and a command. When you see the word command, a command is personal. You know, a command is something that I speak personally to you. A law is written down. It's impersonal. Now, that's why, you know, I'll tell my wife, honey, I love you, and she'll say, then keep my commandments. Um, you know, that's one of our kind of ongoing kind of fun little jokes that we have. And, uh, but that's what a, a command is personal. I look at you and I say, take out the trash. That's a command, you know. And if I was to say, you know, if I was to write a bunch of rules and have you sign it, it would be a law. You know, your responsibility is every Tuesday you have to take out the trash. Then it becomes a law. But if I talk to you personally, it, it's a command, you see. And now that we have this relationship with God, God comes to us on a personal basis and he says, don't do that. Do this. Do this and live. But if you do that, you're going to die. And he's not laying a trip on us. He's not laying a law on us. He's speaking to us personally. And he's saying, this is what is going to work for your life. His commands, it says, are written on the tablets of my heart. Meaning now it's in my heart to obey because I care what God thinks. Used to be I didn't care what God thought. He was dead to me. It didn't, wasn't alive to me. But now that I'm in Christ, I care what he thinks. And I want to please him. I want to make him happy. And so the reason why I want to live life God's way is not because it's the right thing to do or so I won't get into trouble or I won't get punished. You know, and what's the ultimate punish? You're going to go to hell, right? And so I'm not following Jesus so that I don't go to hell. That's not why I follow him. The reason why I want to live God's way is because I love him. And I know that when I do what he tells me to do, it brings joy to his heart and it brings joy into my life. It works. Life works. And so I do it for personal reasons. You know, I do it for personal reasons, not for legal reasons. I do it for personal reasons. And so living life God's way for me is a personal thing. I'm personally responding to Jesus, and he's personally directing my life. And if I do that, then I'm keeping diligence. I'm keeping my heart with all diligence. The third meaning is to tend or guard or watch like a garden or a flock of animals or a house. You know, Proverbs 18.1 says, the preparations of the heart belong to man. It's our job to tend our hearts. You know, it belongs to man. Wherever you are, have living things, you're going to have a constant mess, aren't you? You know, it says in Proverbs 14, 4, where the oxen are, the trough, uh, where there are no oxen, where no oxen are, the trough is clean. So if you have no oxen in your stable, if you have no horses in your stable, let's, let's make it, you know, let's make it uh, up to date for San Juan Capistrano and San Clemente. Uh, if there are no horses in the stable, the stable's clean. What happens when you have horses in the stable? You have horse stuff, right? <laughs> That's just what's going to happen. They're going to eat stuff, and you're going to have horse stuff all over the place. Just a lot of stuff is happening in there. You know, and a garden is living. Things are growing. And so it takes constant attention to maintain the optimum growing environment for a garden. I've heard of animals. They need constant care. They need food. They need medical attention. They need water. They, you need to constantly groom them. And if you don't give all of that care, then the animals get sick. You know, they can get sick. If you don't take care of your heart, your heart can get sick. Uh, the house needs constant attention. It needs constantly to be cleaned and maintained. You know, well... It, it's always kind of funny to me because we'll go and we'll clean the whole house. And then all of a sudden, you know, five minutes later, someone walks in. Well, I should rephrase that. My wife cleans the whole house. Uh, and I lend her support mostly. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, and so she, you know, five minutes later, someone goes in the kitchen and there's, there's something on the floor. And she'll walk in and, and, and go, how did this get dirty? 
You know, well, we live in real time, right? We don't live in, it's not a snapshot. We live in real time. And so being clean is a temporary state, isn't it? So it's going to be clean until it gets dirty 30 seconds later or five minutes later or 10 minutes later. But in our minds, we expect it to be done forever, right? I've cleaned it. I've decreed it. It is clean, and it shall be clean from this point forward. (laughs) That's what we think. And somehow we think it's true for our hearts, don't we? I've come to Jesus, I said the prayer, I made my commitment, it should all be good from this point forward. But it's not, because it takes attention, it takes care, it's something that we have to pay attention to. That's why the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Deal with your offenses before the end of the day, why? So bitterness won't grow in your heart. That's why the Bible says be slow to speak and quick to listen. Why? So you won't say something you'll regret. That's why the Bible says be quick to extend forgiveness. Why? Because unforgiveness dehumanizes you. It makes you less than human. And it makes you treat other people less than human. That's what unforgiveness does. Don't put off dealing with anger or bitterness or for unforgiveness. Deal with it. Keep your heart in constant attention. The fourth meaning is to show respect to your heart by paying attention to it. You see, when you take care of yourself, it raises your self-worth. When you pay attention to what's going on in your heart, it it, it, de- it humanizes you. It raises your, your value uh, in your own eyes, not, not in a negative way, but in a healthy way. You start getting used to being in healthy environments. You know, and when you don't take care of yourself, what, what happens? You get used to being in unhealthy environments. It becomes natural to you. you know, that's why it's, I love having really healthy people around me because they'll they just naturally will start going, hey, why are you living like this? Like what? You know? You know, all you do is you eat fast food. I know, I like it. Well, it's bad for you. You know, you shouldn't eat fast food. You should eat better food. You know, I remember when I thought that Denny's was like a five-star restaurant because it was a step up from McDonald's, you know, until I went to Carol's. And then I found out that Denny's was a one-star restaurant. Carol's was a five-star restaurant. You know, until I kept going up and up until I actually went to a five-star restaurant. And then I had someone else pay the bill. But uh, it was like, you know, one of those things where, you know, you just, as, as you get used to healthier and healthier environments, you look back at where you came from, you go, wow, that, I can't believe I used to live that way. You know, every now and then we'll go back and, and we'll drive in the neighborhoods that we, that we were first at when we got married just for fun. And like a couple of them I look at and I go, wow, I can't believe we actually allowed ourselves to have kids in this neighborhood. You know, it's so bad. You know, it's such a bad part of town. And, but at the time, we thought it was amazing, you know. But, it's to, it's to, but we need to always be caring for ourselves in that way. And as we do, we raise our sense of self-respect. We raise our sense of self-worth. Proverbs 16, 9 says, a man's heart plans his ways. You know, are you making sure that you've uh, stored wisdom and understanding in your heart so that your plans will be blessed by that wisdom? Are you making sure you're, you're caring for your heart in that way? Proverbs twenty two eleven says, leadership will trust a man who loves purity of heart and has grace on his lips. You know, are you making sure that you're keeping your heart free from things that will leave you feeling dirty or critical of others. You know? Sometimes we fill our lives with things that that cause us to be critical of others. Proverbs 23, 12 says to apply uh, your heart to instruction. You know, are you keeping yourself in a place of learning? Are you putting uh, into practice the things that you've learned? Are you you looking at what's going on in your heart? Are you showing... Uh, respect to your heart by paying attention to it, you see. Now, the fifth meaning 
uh, when Solomon says, keep your heart with all diligence, is to store up precious things in your heart, to store up things of value in your heart, to add, you know, it's added value for, to put things in your heart that are going to bring value. You know, and it begs the question, what are you putting into your heart? You know, what are you allowing to enter your heart? You know, Proverbs 7, 1 tells us to treasure God's commands, that that's one of the things, the precious things that we need to put into our hearts, God's commands. Proverbs 24, 4 tells us to treasure knowledge. You know, that we're to treasure knowledge and we're to be growing in knowledge of things. Uh, Proverbs 15, 16 tells us to treasure the fear of the Lord. You know, respecting God is, some, is one of those precious things that, would, that should be in our hearts. You know, if you, if, if you think about it just for a moment, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You know, if you really respect it and began to grow in your respect of the Lord, think of all the things it would keep you from. Think of all the things it would, it would protect you from. You know, hey, let's go over here. Let's do this. I'm not going to do that, man. Why? Because... If God caught me in that place, it would not be good. I'm, I'm going to respect the Lord. I'm going to, you know, I have a reverence for God. I don't belong there. Hey, let's do this. You know, it's fun. I know it's fun for you, but for me, you know, I, I care what God thinks. And if I get caught doing that, it's not going to be good. It's funny to me how we think in those terms. You know, if I get caught and when God sees everything, I mean, he knows, he knows what you're going to do. He actually knows your whole life before you do it, you know, so while you're contemplating it, he's up there going, oh, I know what you're going to do, it's such a drag, I'm going to have to come down and save you again, no, he's not going <laughs> to, Proverbs 2, 4 tells us to treasure wisdom, that we're to store wisdom up in our hearts, that's one of the precious things we're to put in our hearts, how about storing this up in your heart, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, Letting that be stored up in your heart. I'm the beloved of the Father. Letting that be stored up in your heart. Or I'm forgiven. Letting that be one of the precious things that are stored up in your hearts. This is what it means to keep our hearts with all diligence. But how do I do it? How do we practically keep our hearts with all diligence? Well, in Proverbs chapter 4, uh, continuing on with verse 24, it says this. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left and remove your foot from evil. This is how we keep our hearts with all diligence. First of all, wisdom says, watch what you say. Watch what you say. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so whatever is in my heart will ultimately come out of my mouth, good or bad. You know, what, it, it, it also says that in the abundance of words, there's sin. You know, and so... If you talk to someone long enough, you're going to find out what is really inside of them. You're going to find out what's really there. Solomon tells us to put away a deceitful mouth and perverse lips. Now, a deceitful mouth refers to dishonest speech. You know, any kind of dishonest speech. It includes lying, uh, but it also includes manipulation, you know, dishonest speech. It can be manipulation. You know those people that walk up to you and say, hey, what are you doing at 5 o'clock today? I I hate that because whatever you say, you're going to get roped in. So I just go right to it. It's like, well, what what do you need from me? You know, let's just get right down to it. What do you need from me? And I'll tell you if I can do it. You know, because if you say, well, you know, uh, well, you know, I'm doing nothing. It's like, oh, well, I, I can't, you know, can you come do this? Oh, I just remembered. You know, you can't do that. Because now you're lying, you know. Uh, it's like a friend of mine that went to South Africa, and, and they were in a band, and they were traveling, and uh, they went into this lady's house, and it was packed with cats. 
and she just had, you know, like hundreds of cats, and they were everywhere. They were on every furniture. They were on the, on the, on the, uh, they were on the table, and they were eating out of the plates that, that were, you know, there for everyone to, to eat, and she walked in, and she says, dinner is served. And my friend looks at her and goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I just remembered I've been fasting today, and I'm, I just can't eat. I'm sorry. And then he went out and got a hamburger. Um, <laughs> you say, oh, like, like, poor, like, poor cats. No, poor dude. The cats were eating his food. Um, anyhow, you know, that manipulation, flattery. Flattery is dishonest speech. Uh, speaking out of both sides of your mouth is dishonest speech. Perverse lips speak of crookedness or twisting the truth for your own gain or out of, even out of stubbornness. You know, and the real issue behind perverse speech is an unsurrendered heart. It's a heart that's not surrendered to the Lord. And so by saying, put away from you a deceitful mouth and perverse lips, Solomon is saying, make sure your heart is surrendered to God. Make sure you have a a surrendered heart. You know, it's interesting to note that Paul said this also in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. He says, therefore, putting away lying, let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. You know, we want to speak truth because it affects the community. It affects all of us. And Colossians 3, 8 through 10, it says, But now you yourselves are to put off all of these. Anger, these are all things that come out of our mouth. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man and his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. See, we're different people now. That's not who we are. We've, that's an old life to us. We've put that aside. We're no longer identified in that way. You know, that's why I hate that, that term. You know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, you, you, are, you, you, were, you were a sinner, but now you have been saved by grace. And now you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You're a new creation in Christ. And so old things are passed away. And all of that stuff that you used to do, that's not becoming to you now. You know, that's not, you're, you wear new clothes now. You're in a different place. That's not what you're all about. In fact, it looks strange coming out of your mouth now. You know, have you ever been around people and they're, they're like dignified, you know, and, and they're, they're, they're in, you know, like uh, suits and, you know, they look very like, wow, you're really important. And then they say something kind of off color and you're like, oh, that just sounded weird coming out of your mouth. You know, that's how it is for us as believers, you know. People look at us now and like, wait, you're a Christian, you're in Christ. And then you say something like, wow, that just feels weird coming out of you. I just didn't picture that, those two things put together. You know, we're to put those things away. And why are we to put away deceitful mouth? Because truth is what brings freedom. Truth brings freedom to our hearts. Jesus said you will know the truth and what? The truth will make you free, right? So truth brings freedom. Deceitfulness does not bring freedom. It brings a burden, it brings bondage. Now, there's a qualifier because it's not just speaking truth. A lot of people grab a hold of that. I'm just speaking truth. You should not wear that. You look fat. That's truth, right? No, that's, that's mean. Uh, <laughs> I remember we were at a garage sale and this lady was buying something, buying something of my wife's, and she was about 20 over what she should be. And she put this jacket on, and it, it was not quite fitting. And she asked my wife, what do you think? Does this, does this fit me? Does this look good? And she goes, well, if you lost about 20, it'd be great. You know? And so and my wife is just a very honest person. And so, and so she goes, oh, that's great. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> so for her, it was encouragement. But, you know, it's not just speaking truth. But it's speaking truth in what? In love. It's speaking truth in love. You know, when I speak the truth to you because I love you, that's different than just speaking truth. You know, when I I love someone, I'm going to speak the truth to them, but I'm going to do it in a way that where they sense that I love them, that that the love of God is going to come through. That's how I'm going to communicate to them. 
So it's speaking the truth in love. We're to speak what God, what promotes love in our hearts. We're to speak what promotes love of self, uh, not in an unhealthy way again, but in a healthy way. You know, the, the Bible says to love others as you love yourself. So you have to love yourself in order to love others. You know, and not selfish. I'm not talking about being selfish, but I'm talking about understanding who you are and having a, a, a respect uh, and valuing uh, yourself as God's beloved. And so we're to speak what promotes love in our hearts, what promotes love in, in each other, what promotes love of God. And so you want to keep your heart with all diligence. And the way we do that is we speak the truth in love. The second thing that Solomon says here, uh, the way that we can practically um, keep our hearts with all diligence is that we need to watch what we see. Watch what we see. Solomon says, let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids right before you. Now, one way to look at this is like this. Uh, three times in Proverbs, Solomon refers to the one who winks the eye. And it was a symbol of deception and unreliability. You know, squinted eyes and sidelong glances. So, you know, if someone says, hey, we'll go over there. Like, no, you won't, you know. That's the way it says, beware the winker, right, you know? The guy, if there's a guy across the room and you're sitting there and he looks at you and goes like that, just like go the other way, beware the winker. Either that or go tell the guy to go fix whatever's wrong with his eye. So you have an eye problem right there. Beware the winker. And when you look at someone straight in the eye, you're not winking your eye. You're not looking to the side. You're not looking to the left or right. You look them straight in the eye. That's a person you can trust, right? That's a trustworthy person. But another way to look at this verse is found in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. It says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I'm focused on the prize. My eyes are looking straight ahead. My eyelids are right in front of me. I'm not focused to the left. I'm not focused to the right. I'm focused on the goal, on the prize. And here's the spiritual principle behind that. If you're focused on Jesus the prize, you're not going to be distracted by the world. You're not going to be distracted because your eyes are focused on the goal, Jesus Christ. It's when you take your eyes off the prize that distraction sets in. Now, I did run track in high school, and one of the things that they would tell us is don't, don't be looking to the side of you to see who's next to you. Don't look behind you to see what's coming up. Just keep focused ahead. Just run with everything. Keep focused. Don't even worry about what's to the left or right. And what's interesting is that races are lost when a guy starts looking like this. He's running and he's like, oh, who's behind me? And then they trip. Or they look behind them and they lose speed and they lose ground. It's keeping your eyes focused on where you're going, focused on the prize. And so if you want to keep your heart with all diligence, stay focused on on Jesus. Stay focused on Jesus. You know, watch what goes into your eyes and stay focused on him. The third thing that wisdom says is watch where you're walking. Watch where you're walking. He says, ponder the path of your feet. Let all your ways be established. Do not turn from the right or the left and remove your foot from evil. You know, ponder the, path of, uh, ponder the path of your feet. It, it means to make it level, to smooth it out. You know, when you're going to take a, you know, when they're building right now, I'm watching them, they're building the, the roadway over uh, across La Pata into the way. And what are they doing the first thing? They've just started grading things. Now, it makes no sense to me. I'm sure it does to all of them. It looks like random grading to me. But they're starting to make the path smooth. They're, they're, they're leveling it out as much as they can so that they can build a pathway, a roadway through that. And when you're going to build a road, the first thing you do is you come in and you make the path smooth. 
I like to think of it like this. You know, when you're planning on going somewhere, you're going to go on a trip, right? You don't pick the hardest, most difficult, uh, you know, most roundabout, most expensive way to get someplace. You look at a map and you, you find the roads that are the best roads to go on. Uh, you find the places that, you know, where it's easy, where it's level, where it's convenient, where it's going to be most of a cost effective in your way to travel. You know, that's how you plan your trips. You plan the easiest way. That's what Solomon's talking about. Ponder the path. Look for the smoothness. Look for the levelness. Look at where you're going and plan the smoothest way to get through life. And if you do, you'll discover that you took the right way. You'll discover that you took the right way. Look for the level way, the way that, that God is establishing. And that's what he says when he says, let all your ways be established. He's saying, let yourself take the level way. Let yourself take the smooth way, the way that's easy to walk. Now, the hard thing for us is that we grow up in a, an environment, we grow up in a lifestyle, and we take the way that's normal to us, right? We take the way that's normal to us. It's not always the level way. It's not always the smooth way. It's the way that seems normal to us. Oh, it's a few bumps in the road. That's normal. You know, well, that's, you know, but you're, but there's crocodiles all around. Yeah, I know, you know, they're like little mosquito bites. You know, I grew up with crocodiles, no big deal, you know. But that's not God's way. God has a different way. And so Solomon says, let yourself pick the level way. Let yourself pick it. You know, you have to let your, that work happen in your life. I see this when people get married oftentimes. Is, is especially if they've been married two or three times and, and they start picking over and over again the same way that they're used to. They don't let themselves pick the level way. They don't let themselves pick the smooth way. They don't let themselves pick a different way. God says, wisdom says, let yourself take the level way. Stay on the path. Don't go to the left or the right. Don't walk on the path that brings distress and misery, you know. A lot of us become used to the distress and misery in our lives. That becomes normal to us. And so we'll repeat that pattern over and over. But don't do that. Don't take that way. You know, guys, we know that in our work environments or wherever we are, we, we, we kind of scope things out. We know, wow, if I hang out here a little bit more, I might end up talking to that cute receptionist. If I'm over here with this guy, group of people, I might end up, being drawn into something that I shouldn't, you know, be drawn into. If I, if I talk to this person long enough, I know I'm going to develop a, a relationship with this person. He says, get your feet out of there. Remove yourself from evil. Take your feet out of that place. Don't walk in that direction. You know, ladies do the same thing. We know that, hey, you know, I, I counseled many young ladies that they go out dancing after they're married with their with their friends, you know, they're just keeping up their friendships, and, and then they, all of a sudden, they're, they're in my office, and they're like, oh, but I met this guy at this bar, because we were dancing, I'm like, what were you doing there? Why were you even in that environment? Oh, I was hanging out with my friends. You knew better, you know, so it, it says, get your feet out of there, remove yourself from evil, don't sit in that place, we all have those areas of our lives that we know Wisdom tells us, don't do it. Don't go there. Wisdom calls aloud in our lives and says, get away from that place. It's not safe. Something's going to develop. And unfortunately, in my life, you know, I've, I've made those decisions. And sometimes, you know, people will say, well, you know, he's just kind of standoffish or he's not very friendly or he's not very, you know, he's not a very nice person. Yes, maybe so. But I am a very married person and I will have 31 years under my belt. You know, so I decided a long time ago that there was a greater value in my life. Wisdom told me, remove your feet from evil so that you can rejoice in the bride of your youth. You see, and so there's there's simple things, you know, there's places and discussions you shouldn't go to. There's places that you travel that you shouldn't go to. And so if you want to keep your heart with all diligence, 
then just stay away from those places and take the level path. Let yourself take the level path, the smooth path, where there's no distress, where there's no misery, there's no tension. There's nothing in my marriage that's worth uh, getting divorced over. Nothing. There's nothing in my marriage that is worth being tense over or full of distress over. There's nothing. You know, and so when we, when we hit those points of distress, I change instantly. I want to change because I love my wife. It's not because I'm under her laws. It's just I love my wife. And I want to do what affirms her and what affirms our relationship. That is the way of wisdom. That's the smooth and level path. You know, consequently, do I get to do everything I want to do? Yes. I do everything I want to do. We're just going to leave it there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I've done everything I've wanted to do, you know, in my marriage. And the biggest thing I wanted to do was to is be committed to the wife of my youth until the day um, we go to be with the Lord. And so, watch what go- comes out of your mouth. Watch what goes into your eyes. Watch where you're going. That's how we keep our hearts with all diligence. That's how we pay attention to what's going on in our hearts. So what if you do if you haven't been diligent? What do you do if you've made a mistake? What if you do if you haven't been diligent with uh, keeping your heart? Well, I'm a really bad golfer. And uh, it's, it's not a secret. If you're with me five minutes, you'll discover it right away. But one of the things I loved about golfing tournaments is that they would let you do a do-over. You know? And a do-over is when you do a really bad hit, and they just, they just instead of costing you a stroke, they let you just take a do-over. You get to do it over again. And I'm just so glad that God lets us do do-overs. That God gives us do-overs, that I can start fresh today. And if you've made a mistake and you haven't been taking care of your heart, you can start fresh today. Today can be a do-over for you. And that's what is so powerful about communion. Communion is Jesus offering every single one of us a fresh start, every single one of us a do-over. It's that communion that Jesus says, I saw everything that you did wrong and I made provision for you in order for you to be forgiven. And not only did I forgive you, but I've given you my Holy Spirit to give you the power to keep moving forward. So you don't have to stay stuck where you are, but you can move forward in life and you can have life abundant. Isn't that Good news. Aren't you glad that he gives us a do-over? And so we're going to invite uh, the ushers to come down, and, um, and they're going to be distributing the communion as we're, um, as we're singing this last song, as we're singing this song here. And if you would just hold the elements until uh, we all have them, uh, that would be great. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you give us a fresh start with you. And Lord, as I was speaking, Lord, as your word was going forth, Lord, perhaps there are those in our midst that we realize we haven't been taking care of our hearts, that we've allowed things in our hearts that have brought pain into our relationships, that have brought distress and misery into our homes and our businesses, that maybe we failed at a business, we failed at a relationship, we failed at something because we've allowed something in that we shouldn't have. But Lord, I'm so glad that you don't treat us as our sins deserve, but you show us mercy. And Lord, as we stand before your table here this morning, we realize that you paid the highest price for us that you made a way for us to be totally free, 
to be forgiven, to have a second chance to have a do-over, Lord. And I pray even now, Lord, as you're searching our hearts, Lord, that you would, uh, that wherever that comes up, Lord, that we failed you, Lord, that you would cover it. Wash us clean, Lord. That we would receive your forgiveness, your grace. And Lord, that we would begin fresh with you today. And maybe you just need to take a moment and just say, Lord, I'm just going to ask for, for, for your forgiveness. And just receive that. And allow him to wash clean your heart and to empower you by your spirit by his spirit to let him pull the weeds out of your heart to let him pull out any bitterness or anger fear insecurity the words that have been spoken that have that have stuck into your mind for him to take those stingers those barbs out and to wash you and renew you in his love and so as we uh, sing this song, just receive from the Lord this morning. An ocean of forgiveness My sins are cast away A river of God's mercy But my soul is washed in me Where can I go to Where I can Ocean of forgiveness, this sinner can find peace. An ocean of forgiveness, when my sins are cast away. River of God's mercy, when my soul is washed in me. Where can I go to? I can't be free. An ocean of This sinner can find peace. So I will lay down my burden. I will lay down my burden. I will lay down my burden. As I serve. burden so I will lay down my burden I will lay down my burden
ocean of forgiveness where the love of God leads me an ocean of forgiveness 